My name is Jan Kalamita. I'm the head of investment law and policy at the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. Thank you very much for joining us today for this book launch event on sustainable development, investment law in the European Union. Um, at the outset, I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Schacher, whose book, Sustainable Development in EU Foreign Investment Law, has provided the impetus for today's event. Uh, Dr. Schacher is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for International Law, and it's my pleasure to have had her as my colleague for the past year. I'd also like to thank Dr. Angelos uh, Demopoulos of Queen Mary University London, who is our co-convener for today's event. Dr. Demopoulos is senior lecturer at Queen Mary and an expert in EU external relations law. His monograph on EU foreign investment law, published in 2011, is an early and important work in the field. So our conference today will proceed in two parts. Our first panel, which I have the pleasure of moderating, addresses the legal effects of sustainable development in international investment and comments on the specific contribution of the EU to the integration of sustainable development into international investment treaties. We will begin with opening remarks from Professor August Reinisch, who I'll introduce in a moment, followed by a presentation by Dr. Schacher. Angelos Demopoulos will then be our discussant and we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Should you have any questions, please do type them into the chat box during the talks or wait to raise your hand during the question and answer session. Then following panel one, we'll take a short break and then we'll return for our second panel, which will look closer at the trade and sustainable development chapters of the EU's IIAs. These chapters have been praised for creating a distinct promotional model for regulating the linkage between investment and trade on the one hand and sustainable development. That said, the implementation and enforcement of these provisions remain subject to debate. Questions arise as to whether consultation and expert recommendations are enough or whether these provisions ought to be enforceable through some kind of sanctions-based mechanism. To address these issues, we have a panel of world-leading experts, Professor Laurence Poisson de Chazoun, Professor of International Law at the University of Geneva, Professor Garcia Marin Duran, Associate Professor of International Economic Law at University College London, and Professor James Harrison, Professor of Law at the University of Warwick. So now let me turn things over to Professor Reinisch for some opening remarks. Professor Reinisch is the head of the section on international law and international relations at the University of Vienna. He's also a member of the International Law Commission, the author of dozens of works on public international law and international law of investment, and also a frequent arbitrator in investor state disputes. He is moreover someone I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years. So without more, August, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jansen, uh, for kindly hosting this conference uh, together with Angelos uh, on uh, sustainable development, investment law, and in particular, the role of the European Union. Uh, I'm uh, very proud and glad uh, to be able to give some introductory remarks, although introductory remarks are always a very delicate thing. Uh, they should remain introductory, not say everything that will be said later on. On the other hand, they shouldn't be too superficial. So I'll try to steer here. Um, and uh, of course, I've also immensely uh, benefited from reading uh, the uh, work of uh, Stephanie uh, her book on uh, the sustainable development in the EU's uh, foreign investment uh, policy. Now, the EU, of course, is a fairly recent actor in regard uh, to uh, the uh, development of investment law. 
Um, it was uh, the Treaty of Lisbon that introduced uh, foreign direct investment as a part of the common commercial policy, what used to be a very trade focused external power of the European Union on the basis of which the EU and its predecessor, the European Economic Community, entered into free trade agreements from the very start. Uh, nowadays, most of the free trade agreements have separate investment chapters and the challenge was uh, to introduce a sustainable development values because uh, clearly the European Union considers sustainable development to be one of the core values on which its foreign policy, including its uh, trade and investment policy, should be based. Um, it has approached this in particular by uh, a way that international lawyers, and I'll try to take the lens of a generalist, the perspective of a public international lawyer, focusing on methods that work via interpretation. What do I mean by that? We have seen that the EU in its uh, free trade agreements that contain investment chapters uh, often has some language in the preamble of those agreements referring to sustainable development, referring to a commitment to promote sustainable development, which in the sense of Article 31, the preamble can be resorted to as uh, a text uh, that serves to enlighten us in regard to the purpose uh, of the treaty. It's uh, for the teleological interpretation, it gives context. So in many senses, it allows those who are charged with interpreting investment agreements and as uh, we know in the more recent EU agreements uh, this will be not traditional investor state arbitral panels uh, but uh, the so-called uh, investment court system developed by the European Union and its treaty partners. Uh, equally the separate chapters uh, that uh, deal with trade and sustainable development in uh, many of the more recent EU free trade agreements, they equally uh, contain a commitment uh, to sustainable development and in particular to sustainable development in the context of integrating economic social and environmental protection as aspects of sustainable development. So we have also here an element that serves for the interpretation of the agreement. And finally, in a number of these agreements entered into by the European Union, we have joint interpretive instruments, uh, which again, reconfirm sustainable development. So in a way we have uh, a proliferation of tools uh, that can help um, in the actual interpretation of agreements. In addition to that, uh, the trade and sustainable development uh, chapters of many of those agreements will give rise to special mechanisms. What do I mean by mechanisms? Of course, we all know that there is hesitancy of actually allow dispute settlement in a classical sense in regard to compliance with these chapters. Uh, and I understand that in the second panel, we will hear more about the consultation process, the expert panels uh, that uh, are set up in order to operationalize what is agreed upon in trade and sustainable development chapters of the EU. Uh, finally, and I presume Stephanie will say a few words, 
um, the European Union in its treaty making process also provides for a sustainability impact assessment. Um, of course, uh, for classical trained lawyers, uh, it always is fascinating uh, how difficult it is to predict the impact of trade agreements, including their investment chapters on sustainability in a more broader sense. But we can see the treaty making process as well as the outcome of the, pro of the process, uh, new investment chapters uh, take very seriously the concern about uh, sustainable development and have integrated them uh, to a remarkable degree. And uh, as I said, I think the most uh, authoritative recent book on the topic has been written by Stephanie Schacherer and Dr. Schacherer is the expert who will tell us more about it now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, August. Stephanie, I turn things over to you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Kalabita. Thank you very much, Professor Reinisch. It's, of course, a tremendous uh, pleasure for me to have this panel and to be able to present um, the book and the main findings of um, sustainable development in EU foreign investment law. Um, so I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation to allow everybody to follow um, more easily. So bear with me, I'm going to sh share my slides. Yes. So we have allocated around 20 minutes for this book presentation. And um, I would like to um, spend some time on the methodological framework of the book in order to really set clearly what the book is about, huh? to really set the expectations for the readers of what they can find in the book and what is not in the book. We will then have a closer look into the concept of sustainable development more in EU uh, law, EU co common commercial policy and um, in international law. And finally, even though not exhaustively, but we will have some examples of where um, the contribution of the European Union is uh, worthwhile um, considering. So with this, let me give a little bit of uh, context. Um, you all remember that at the beginning of 2021, the European Union finally or finalized negotiations with a very controversial partner, China, on a comprehensive agreement on investment. The agreement was um, followed by harsh criticism and Part of the main criticism was really to say the agreement is not doing enough in terms of integrating concerns of sustainable development and in particular with respect to a negotiating partner like China when it comes to labor standards and human rights. And in contrast to these criticisms often coming from the European Parliament and civil society groups, we have the European Commission that is constantly upholding the position of the European Union as a leader in international trade and investment of uh, promoting a fair and value-based uh, policy. You have here on the screen the latest uh, trade um, strategy of the European Union, also published at the beginning of this year. And we see that once again, the Commission highlights the ability of the European Union to shape the world around it through leadership and engagement reflecting values. And these values also include sustainable development. It all sounds like a political struggle, right? How do you get it right that sustainable development is integrated in an economic agreement? However, for the European Union, it is likewise a legal struggle. Why is it legal? 
because since the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, the EU has a legal obligation to take sustainable development into account in its common commercial policy. And we have the Court of Justice of the European Union um, confirming this obligation in the landmark opinion 215, uh, which related to the EU-Singapore trade agreement, and where we really have re-emphasis this, ob this obligation of integrating sustainability. So here I quote, the guarantee of adequate social protection and environmental protection requirements must be integrated into the definition and implementation of the union's policies and activities, in particular with a view to promoting sustainable development." End of quote. And the opinion came out in May 2017, and this was about the time uh, where I uh, started also to write um, the, the PhD dissertation. I started uh, in, in 2016, so 17, it was already high time to, to formulate, of course, the hypothesis and the research question. So, and on based on all these elements, on the one hand, affirming leadership, having an obligation to integrate sustainability, development and also having the competences now to be an actor in foreign direct investment led me to formulate this hypothesis, which is the EU has become an important global actor in transforming international investment law in light of sustainable development. The research question to test the hypothesis asks more concretely, to whether and to what extent the post-Lisbon international investment lawmaking of the European Union integrates sustainable development. In other words, I was interested in analyzing the European Union as a global actor in a way of seeing how the Union acts, reacts and contributes to a debate that is very uh, difficult. It's the debate on the articulation between international investment law and sustainable development. The good thing with research question is that it also allows to limit the scope of a research. And so in this respect, or when it comes to the book, it's important to um, emphasize that the book is not about how international investment agreements ought to integrate sustainable development. There are many um, publications already out there. So this book is not about a normative um, improvement suggestion to international investment regimes. It's about the contribution of the European Union. And second, the book is also not about an empirical investigation of whether EU's trade and investment agreements effectively led to sustainable development outcomes in the EU or in the partner countries. And this brings me to another important part of the methodology, and this is the role of assumptions. So I think that any legal scholar dealing with uh, sustainable development and international investment agreements um, should point out that we are uh, doing this based on some assumptions. And the, the key assumption is really to say, well, an international investment agreement can enhance sustainable development. And underlining this assumption is this famous um, dual causal link between, on the one hand, um, we assume or we accept the correlation between foreign direct investment and development or sustainable development, and we accept that uh, investment agreements can enhance FDI inflows, okay? Because for both actually relations, we don't have clear-cut economic um, evidence from economics. And therefore, this is an important assumption uh, to, to highlight. The other assumption is uh, since the book um, departs really from the fact that we are in an ongoing reform, I would also like to stress that there is an assumption on the need for reform of the international re investment regime, and this reform should be done in light of sustainable development. Now, how do I assess um, the EU as a global actor? I apply a method that can be called a double benchmark method. Um, it is to say that 
we assess the European Union based on two normative frameworks. The first one derives from international law. So the International Sustainable Development Agenda. Um, and the second one really derives from the EU constitutional framework. So the self-imposed obligations um, by the European Union in its treaties, in the Lisbon Treaty, um, and um, the key constitutional principles. More concretely, this looks as follows. So we have here, um, on the one hand, sustainable development in international law and international investment agreement. Uh, and yeah, so I have dealt with this in chapter two of the book, um, where I really go about um, the concept and its, um, its key principles that fall under the bigger framework of sustainable development. So we can think of here of equity principles, um, intergenerational as well as intragenerational equity principles, a number of soft law instruments that exist. If we look more closely on international investment law, we do have uh, state practice since the 10, 15 past years where um, states try to find um, ways in which you can um, integrate sustainable development uh, explicitly or um, in a more indirect way in international investment agreements. And of course, there is tremendous amount of work done by international organizations such as UMTAT and other also non-governmental organizations on the topic. So in chapter two, I really tried to set the scene, um, clarify what uh, the debate is all about and where we currently stand in international practice. The chapters three and four then deal with European Union law. Um, three more precisely, um, more generally, sorry, with the EU legal order and then four more precisely with the common commercial policy. We don't have time today to go into the details and um, complexities of European Union law. You have here some of the key provisions on the slide, sustainable development within the European legal order is a union objective and these kind of objectives are binding on all uh, institutions and have to be integrated in, um, in the policies, including the investment policy. There is the principle of integration, so integration of social and environmental integration, as well as the principle of policy coherence, to which I also give emphasis uh, in this um, conceptual framework under European Union law. Lastly, also the EU has uh, some soft law instruments, such as um, communications from the European Commission. This slide is very briefly to give us all a sense of what it actually means both in international and European Union law, and it could even be applied for national law, actually, um, what it means to integrate sustainable development. Because we start from a very general concept, the so-called three pillars of sustainable development. And I'm sure everybody in the audience knows these three pillars, which are economic development, social development, and environmental protection. And yeah, we want the integration of the three. When we integrate then sustainable development, we have to contextualize the concept into a specific policy area. This means it can turn out to be slightly different from policy to policy. Today, we look at international investment law. And from this policy, then we need concretization. And the concretization, I would argue, is where us lawyers, we come in and see how the provisions, uh, treaty text is actually being drafted. Um, and what is the legal instrument that we are talking about? For today's purposes, and also for the purpose of my book, of course, we look into the legal instrument of international investment agreements. I also would like to offer another helpful conceptual uh, way of thinking about sustainable development more concretely in international investment agreements. So um, I offer here three. One is the concept can make us think about international investment agreements as a tool to stimulate investments 
in areas where money and capital is most needed in order to achieve the sustainable development goals. This is sounds pretty straightforward, right? We want to channel investments, for example, into renewable energies. Um, it is, however, in practice, um, pretty complicated. Another way of thinking about sustainable development in um, the rearm of international investment agreements is to see international investment agreements also as a tool to preserve policy space for sustainable development measures at the national level. Yeah, so sustainable development uh, reforms or legislative reforms that are triggered by the need to implement um, sustainable development policies. And of course, here in this sort of function of the concept, we are very close in the whole universe of debate about the right to regulate, uh, which is very prominent, of course, in the reform of international investment law. Lastly, um, sustainable development allows us to think about international investment agreements as a tool to enhance and advance international cooperation in the field of sustainable development. And this sometimes um, receives less attention in um, the reform debate, even though we see a treaty practice here. What I mean actually is that we have commitments by the contracting parties to say that they want to or they re-emphasize their commitments under um, their international labor organization membership or they re-emphasize their commitments under the Paris Agreement or it can also be cooperation to strengthen actually national laws. With this in mind, uh, let me now turn to a brief overview of uh, the agreements that are assessed uh, in uh, the book. I, I, for time reasons, it came out too late and the China one is not in it, but I have to say better so because um, it seems unlikely that that one is going, um, is going further. So you see here on the left side, the FTAs that either have an investment chapter or that are combined with an investment protection agreement. And there are the four key ones that were actually finalized at the time when I was, I was mainly writing the book. Yeah, so there is um, the CETA, of course, the FTA with Mexico, uh, FTA and IPA Vietnam, FTA IPA Singapore. On the other hand, you see um, those FTAs that have no investment chapter and no related IPA, but these agreements are still relevant to the extent that they contain actually trade and sustainable development chapters, and they are also relevant for uh, market access and investment liberalization. And when um, kind of looking at these agreements, of course, I always needed to keep in mind the methodology that I was, um, that I had developed the double benchmark of on the one hand, to what extent do these treaties um, set up uh, something new compared to what has already been done at the international level. And then also whether these uh, treaties really comply with the constitutional ambitions and uh, policy ambitions of uh, the European Union. Uh, so they are, of course, there are some key uh, other global actors in the international sphere, such as the United States, Canada, but then also a number of developing countries and their EIAs that I analyzed. So I'm moving now um, to the part of the book that is really analyzing these agreements. And this is part two. It's covering three chapters that in a way I tried to put into this table. And for the purpose of this presentation, you see here again in the very left column, uh, I have um, included the um, functions that sustainable development uh, can uh, bring about in an investment agreement. So if we think, is the European Union doing something in order to stimulate investment that is needed for the SDGs? Well, it's not very strong language and Professor Reinisch mentioned it. We have a nice um, 
preambular languages, we have a nice objective statements. We also have promotional language that we find in trade and develop sustainable development chapters, um, just indicating that the parties want to promote, let's say again, um, renewable energy investments. So it stays at the very low, I would say, a level of, of ambition here. In terms of preserving policy space, I have to be brief on that, but there is, of course, uh, the whole um, rewriting in a sort or making more precise um, uh, investment protection standards that is done by the European Union. Yes, you find those provisions in investment chapters and EPAS. Um, and on the third, um, on cooperation, I think here the prime example would really be to see uh, the trade and sustainable development chapter, even though it has flaws, but compared in the, in the international uh, sphere, um, in my book I still highlight that the EU is offering here some innovation. I will also not go into further detail since we will discuss uh, labor and environment um, in the next panel. However, what I would like to do in the time that is left, I would like to look a little bit more closely into the two things that are highlighted here in orange. Yeah? So this is the uh, investment liberalization and responsible business conduct. And so you see that I put investment liberalization under preserving policy space and responsible business conduct or corporate social responsibility under the function of cooperation. But first on investment liberalization. It's very interesting. On the one hand, you can say, yes, the European Union integrates sustainable development concerns in international investment liberalization because the European Union, even though it's a very uh, liberal kind of promoting of open markets and so on, liberalization is never absolute. And also in trade and investment agreements of the European Union, we have a number of excluded sectors. And these sectors are sensitive to sustainable development. So we would have the exclusion of health, of education and of water supply. At the same time, the European Union's approach when it comes to investment liberalization, and I emphasize on market access in third countries, is relatively aggressive, one can even say, compared to other global actors, because we have this set of three provisions, market access provisions, then prohibitions on performance requirements and pre-establishment rights in the non-discrimination provisions. And if you think of especially prohibitions of performance requirements, these are commitments that can preclude particularly developing country partners, when they want to adopt certain economic development measures, such as transfer of technology legislation. Yeah, but transfer of technology legislation is, is explicitly prohibited under the provision that we find in EU investment agreements. So if we take sustainable development serious here in this respect, yeah, and take again what I mentioned, the equity principle and filling the gap between the rich and the poor countries, and also thinking about regulatory space when it comes to actual measures that touch upon economic development, we see here that the interests of the union seem to have prevailed. And also I would like to say about investment uh, liberalization that based on the treaties, trade and investment liberalization should serve sustainable development. So it is a means to an end. But what we see in practice is that the European Union is um, promoting market access as an end in itself. Now, if we take the second example that I would briefly also like to discuss responsible business conduct. And of course, here I'm opening to some extent a window, which is a huge uh, debate, of course, of discussing investor responsibilities, of discussing the responsibilities of multinational enterprises in the international um, legal order. Um, very controversial. And if we 
look at what the European Union is offering in its trade and investment agreements, again, yes, we can say, of course, there are provisions on corporate social responsibilities. There are provisions that are addressed to the contracting parties in a best endeavor promotional manner to say, yes, we want um, to implement the OECD uh, guidelines on multinational enterprises or the UN compact. So all these best uh, practices that exist at the international level, but we don't have more. And again, if we take it as a global actor and we look what other countries are doing, well, there are other countries and regions in the world that are offering much more innovation in this respect. So the European Union, a rather conservative actor here. Um, and I would add from a European Union perspective, we can even say a little bit regressive because the EU has done better in the past. We have um, a... Um, agreement that is the economic partnership agreement with the CARICOM states, uh, where we have a much more elaborated uh, provision on investor behaviors, Article 72, um, which, is, which predates the Lisbon Treaty, but now today we have something less ambitious. Yes, so with this, I think I want to conclude. Uh, a conclusion is um, difficult to make and is certainly not clear cut. I think uh, in overall, and this is of course in overall has to be emphasized, the sustainable development objective has found integration in EU's investment lawmaking. I would even, um, and as I did in the book, I show yes, um, that the EU is a global actor in doing it. Um, and we have just to be careful not to generalize it overly, but to really look close in what we're talking about and where there is still some, um, some way where we find maybe superficial policy approaches or incoherent uh, policy approaches where the aspiration does not quite fit the practice. And I finish uh, with a sentence that is actually in my conclusion. And this is just to say that the case of the European Union shows to a particular extent the dichotomy that can exist between idealistic aspirations based on value-driven policy and the real-life economic constraints that the European Union is facing. So with this, I thank you very much um, for your attention. I thank once again uh, Professor August Reinisch um, for his intervention, and he was actually my PhD supervisor. So this is again a very warm <laughs> thank you for, for all your guidance. And uh, with this, I, I turn over back to, back to Janssen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that uh, the fascinating overview of, of your book and uh, some of the issues that, uh, that you address in it. Um, I will turn things over immediately to, to Angelos for his, uh, for his intervention and his observations. Angelos. Thank you very much, uh, Janssen. And before I start, I would like to thank you and Stephanie for taking the lead in organizing this event, that I was more than happy to, to help and contribute, given that we were discussing a very topical and a very important uh, area of international law where there are major, and European law, where there are major current developments. And secondly, because uh, there is an excellent book, the one written by Dr. Shaher, that deals with a very critical aspect of, uh, that contributes significantly to this debate. And I think that uh, what this book, which uh, Stephanie just presented, what the book covers, does a, an excellent job at contributing to scholarship, both in the field of international investment law and in particular, the, the debate on reshaping the, the, the balance between investment and sustainable development, but also in understanding EU external relations law and how the EU uh, addresses within its own constitutional framework, these very significant concerns. And I think there is a greater need for scholars like Dr. Shaher and for books like the one that she contributed, which help enhance the dialogue between European Union lawyers and international lawyers and aims to contribute equally into both fields and provides a valuable synthesis 
of both fields. Now, I would like to, to draw in particular my, my comments on some of the conclusions that uh, the book draws and take the discussion on from there. I think uh, in as the book deals with EU practice on how sustainable development interacts with investment law, uh, what the book actually is, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, the book actually uh, explains what is the contribution of the EU as a global actor on the debate in international investment law between investment, uh, uh, investment objectives and sustainable development on the one hand, but also it tries to help us understand, and I think that's a, def a second uh, objective, that is, does the EU uh, follow in its practice the objectives that are set in EU law and policy? And I think on the bay, I don't want to repeat what Je Stephanie was just saying, but I would like to draw the point on some of the comments that, uh, 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 on, on some of the conclusions that are drawn in the book. And I think the first one, which both Stephanie and August already highlighted is that the EU brings fresh air and introduces a new model for interaction between sustainable development and investment law. And as Stephanie highlighted, this is particularly uh, done in two ways. On the one hand, uh, via building relationships between international economic law and international social and environmental standards, enhancing cooperation, and this is in particularly done in the trade and sustainable development chapter, which I think I will leave the, the questions from that part for the, for the second panel. And secondly, by uh, preserving the regulatory space of investment recipient countries, to adopt uh, measures that are conducive to sustainable development, to enhance domestic regulatory autonomy. These are the two key contributions that the EU brings to the debate. How does it die to do that? Via enabling the interpreters of the law, as August mentioned, to use these tools to achieve, to uh, uh, offer more regulatory space to uh, uh, the governments of whole states and by creating the space for cooperation. I think what we need to, to, to discuss, and I will go to the two points that Stephanie had also highlighted in her, uh, in her slides, to discuss is that what is left out is that the EU did not take a very ambitious approach uh, with regard to um, tools that could contribute to make investment law more sustainable development friendly in the sense of omitting provisions on investors uh, obligations making some uh, uh, the uh, making uh, uh, references to corporate social responsibility uh, uh, making very limited references which are not always the ones that are uh, very clear or or specific and what we see here, if we want to, to uh, uh, compare the contribution of the EU to the contribution of other global actors on the debate, is we see that there are other countries, such as India or Brazil, that take a completely different approach with regard to the responsibility of the investors and the role that investors can play in contributing to sustainable development, and also on the obligations that state assume in order to, to uh, uh, impose these additional obligations or to stimulate or in a way to ensure the compliance of investment activity with sustainable development standards. The second point that I think uh, Stephanie highlighted was on investment liberalization. And investment liberalization is also a key feature of EU investment agreements in general, because the EU is one of the very few international investment actors that relies on liberalization. And what we see there is that the EU follows past practices. And this is actually the chapter of investment agreements where we see the least influence of sustainable development norms and objectives. <clears throat> 
what I want to, to, to add to this debate is that an explanation of why the EU has been uh, shied away from introducing more obligations, or let's say the investors' obligations, why they focused on regulatory autonomy, and uh, why they, they, uh, they continued with the existing model of investment liberalization. And I think to that, it's an answer that uh, the book uh, offers, and I think we can discuss it even further, would be that the EU's trade interests remain at the very core of the, its objectives under the common commercial policy. The, the identification of the EU's trade interests, the interests of the EU industry, and the interests of uh, liberalization and opening up markets to EU investors is a key reason justifying why the EU has not been very willing to integrate sustainable development in the context of investment liberalization. Stephanie mentioned uh, earlier in her presentation how that would be a very, uh, um, why, how uh, provisions on performance requirements could limit, uh, says, uh, could uh, limit the options for sustainable development in host countries. But I would add to that that the potential that investment liberalization provisions have to achieve another objective. I think I would put the first block that Stephanie had in her, uh, in her excellent slides, which is to stimulate investments in areas where capital for achieving SDGs is required the most. And investment liberalization provisions can play a tremendous role in that regard. And this is to me an opportunity missed. If we see though, we, of course it's not all negative. And I think we need to consider that there are huge improvements in particular considering the language used to offer more policy space to regulate to host countries in order to achieve sustainable development objectives. But if we dig a little bit behind why the EU insists on introducing this language in its investment treaties, we see again that it, this is also driven by internal legal requirements. I would like to draw the attention to opinion 117 that Stephanie discusses as well in her book. And the key tenet of that opinion of the European Court of Justice was to say that investment agreements such as CETA in, in that case are compatible with EU law to the extent that they do not affect, do, they do not tamper with the ability of EU institutions to set the level of protection of different public interests. This provision is, has, I, in my view, far-reaching implications, because in a way, the European Union does not want to bind itself and its member states under international law to obligations that would uh, go beyond, uh, that would, of course, their mem its member states, to decide uh, uh, to take measures to protect sustainable development. I think this is also, we can see that this contribution is driven again by internal reasons. Um, and again, I think on cooperation, I, I leave the point on the TSD to discuss uh, a little bit uh, during the second panel. This, I think, brings us to the second key contribution that the book uh, is actually making, which is, does EU practice, does the EU follow in its practice what it preaches? And I think as Stephanie mentions very clearly in her uh, uh, book, and I think I'm, I'm quoting here uh, that uh, EU policy documents offer discretion to EU institutions, in particular to the Commission, in shaping sustainable development objectives in real obligation and balancing them against other interests. But the court places emphasis on the scope of maneuver that EU institutions have in conducting their policies and when they negotiate international economic agreements. As Stephanie pointed earlier, the, 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 the objectives that are found in the EU treaties are binding. However, the court is very reluctant to assess the implementation of these objectives in practice. There is a great scope for, of maneuver given 
to EU institutions when they decide how and to what extent sustainable uh, development objectives are uh, become part of e or become uh, uh, how and in what way they inform the policy choices that the EU makes and how these policy choices are transformed into hard law obligations. And despite the different principles, the substantive principles which Mentioning, uh, Stephanie mentions uh, and explains very, very clearly in her book, such as the principle of integration, of environmental integration, the impact that they have on EU, on the uh, new EU investment policy apparently is not um, to the extent that it would, for example, help the EU change its paradigm on investment liberalization. With this in mind, I think um, what I think an important principle in that regard internally would be the principle of coherence that Stephanie uh, again highlights its role and its importance internally. And from that, I think from the need for coherence, I will start. I think I wanted to raise a last few points for discussion, which is if we need to, if this coherence is a policy objective, which uh, exists on paper, but doesn't always translate in practice, we could start considering what is the institutional framework within the EU that is charged with trans translating these objectives into practice, that is charged with ensuring coherence in EU external action between its environmental policy and its investment policy. And I think if we look into this institutional framework, we need to review the role that the key institutions have in the debate, and in particular, the European Commission. We need to re-examine the role that the Court of Justice has in uh, uh, subjecting uh, EU policies to judicial review and the, the scope of judicial review, and again, review and reconsider the role of member states in shaping that policy. Just to give you an example, since 2010, member states have concluded more than 45 investment treaties with other countries. And what we see in that practice, which since 2011, any new investment treaty negotiated and concluded by a member state has to be authorized by the European Commission. What we see in these treaties is a great degree of divergence on how they deal, especially on, with the question of investment and sustainable development. And I think this divergence that exists among member states, between member states and the European Union, illustrates to a certain extent, to me, the institutional deficit and the lack of agreement internally within the EU and its member states on the approach, on the appropriate approach to, uh, to, in, to achieve that integration. And I think this example also showcases that uh, the, the, the limits of the EU's contribution to the broader debate that Stephanie highlighted from the beginning, where should we, how should we uh, balance investment on the one hand and sustainable development on the other. To me, to make it clearer, I think if the EU cannot convince its member states in their investment treaty practices to follow on its own model, how can it expect the, the rest of the world to be a world leader, to be a normative actor, a global normative actor, and convince the rest of the world to follow suit? So I think, with that point, I will stop so that we have, uh, I see that there are a lot of uh, uh, ch uh, comments already in the chat. So uh, again, thank you very much. And I will turn the floor back to Jensen. Thank you very, very much, <clears throat> Angelos. Um, you've raised quite a lot of issues and I'd, I'd like to give Stephanie the opportunity to, to offer some, some thoughts and response, and then we can begin to open things up to the questions in the chat and 
live questions from the audience. Stephanie, would you like to say a few things? Yes, thank you very much, Janssen. Thank you um, very much also, um, Angelos. Um, it's um, a real pleasure, pleasure, of course, to have you and your insights uh, as a key expert in international um, and especially EU external relations law, right? So this is, this is very, very useful, I think, even for now thinking um, further than the book. Um, I don't have too much uh, that I would like to re-emphasize. I definitely uh, would say on liberalization, and I have this in the book as well, that um, so on this idea, yes, we want to channel investments to the sustainable development goals. I think uh, policy approaches that go beyond promotional nice words um, uh, are the investment definition and our provisions on investment liberalization. Here, in principle, we would have a possibility to, uh, to steer into SDG sectors um, by, yes, by choosing the right uh, sectors that are to be liberalized and giving here concessions and there. So this is definitely something um, that uh, First of all, we don't necessarily see in the in the EU um, agreements, but also we don't see it, even if we take it again up to the international level, um, we don't see it sufficiently. I am the current reform debate is uh, still in 2021, we have to say, still very much focused on this right to regulate. And um, this was actually another, just also a concluding uh, word that I give in the book, yeah? So if we think about sustainable development integration, uh, first of all, really have to move on from the right to regulate. It's an issue, but it's not the only one. There are much more things that we could, that we could uh, work on and, um, and elaborate more, such as channeling sustainable investment and um, cooperation um, in uh, sustainable investment issues. Now, I really liked uh, the last uh, point. It was really uh, smashing the European Union, um, clear um, criticism on if you can't organize your own house, how would you ever be a credible global actor at the international um, level? And this, this is of course very true. I think um, it uh, would be a further um, kind of research, right, to assess um, these uh, BITs uh, that have been done since the Lisbon Treaty by EU member states um, in, in, in how much they actually follow the European Union uh, model. Um, yes, so this is very, very important. I think on the um, coherence principle, um, coherence is a um, important principle in European Union law. We know that uh, there is this um, sort of will that there should be coherence between the different policies. And um, Angelos mentioned environmental law as, for example, where we should have um, coherence between investment policy and environmental policy. But there is also development cooperation that I would like to bring in, which we, uh, which actually where we see for the investment regime uh, incoherence when it comes to the practice of the European Union. Um, and and these, are in, these are important considerations. Yeah, so this is, this is definitely something uh, that has not been done uh, sufficiently well from the EU institutions. Yeah, with this, Thanks again, Angelos, and back to Jensen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I have a, some questions of my own, but but one of the the points that you were you were just touching on touches on a, a question that's been raised in the chat, and that is with respect to the the definition and the content of sustainable development in the EU's treaties. You you touched on this in your presentation, but I wonder if you can say something more about where from where is the EU's concept of sustainable development in its treaties um, finding being informed? Is it from public international law? Is it exclusively from EU law? Is it some kind of lex specialis within the individual treaties? Maybe you could add a, a bit on that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for the question um, from the audience as well, as I understand. So I the EU 
sustainable development concept uh, comes from international law, right? So it all started with uh, the, the Rio conference in 92. And we see that from then on, the concept was integrated into EU primary law and the treaties. So, uh, and I also argue in the book that this was for the EU actually a, a um, constant understanding to up date in a way always what is done at the international level for sustainable development agenda uh, in uh, also its internal policy. Um, then again, if you go a little bit more into details, you can identify certain EU specific uh, specificities. Um, I would, um, I think I highlighted as particularly economic growth. These are things that the EU is very much emphasizing for its internal market. And we don't find the same emphasis in the international law sphere. When we now look at the definition of sustainable development in the investment agreement, and uh, we have here the best statements in the trade and sustainable development chapters, it's actually the first article of each of those chapters, where we really have a, um, a statement of, of, of sustainable development, once again, the famous three pillar structure, uh, and what the sustainable development chapter is actually nicely doing. And I think this is a very good way how the European Union is doing it again. So we have here a, an element of coherence because it embeds the TSD chapter into the um, more global, more broader uh, international sustainable development agenda. So it makes reference to the Rio Declaration. It makes reference to the 2000 to Johannesburg uh, Declaration, and it makes, of course, reference to the 2015 um, Agenda 2030 with the famous 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So yes, here, for the purpose of investment agreements, close uh, connection to what is done at the international level. I wonder, just to, to follow up on that, um, and again, from, from the, the comments, um, does the does the impact of sustainable development um particularly in the eu's ipas um what effect does it have that those ipas have been hived off from the larger ftas even though they were originally intended to be comprehensive documents now they they're standalone so does that affect the impact of sustainable development on the interpretation of these treaties um, that's a that's a, actually an excellent question, and the the reason so the answer I would give is 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 no because I don't know it by heart, but there is a provision in both of the agreements in the EPA as well as in the FTA that refers back to the other treaty and makes it um, so to say. Um, Part. But the formulation now I can't from the top of my head, I don't remember the exact formulation, but it's 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 said in a sense that they form, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to say integral part, but something like that. Uh, is it integral part? Okay, I see. Angel uh, no, not sure. Okay. Um, but uh, they are definitely closed. And actually what I, this allows me to say something that goes uh, a little bit also beyond because the European Union also has framework agreements, for example, if we take Vietnam, um, so before even entering into a FTA or investment protection agreement, there would be a framework agreement where the, which actually also fuels in into the, the more, the broader framework then. And, and in these framework agreements, you also have provisions on investment and you have commitments to sustainable uh, development. So um, actually, yes, we have to understand these instruments, I would say, in a, in an interconnected manner. And um, yes, I can, after the conference, maybe uh, check out the exact um, number of the articles to, um, to provide. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I have another question from, from the audience, um, and then perhaps we'll see if, if Angelus and, and August have any questions or observations they'd like to put to you uh, in light of all that's been said. Um, and that question is with respect to the, the role of the counterparties in in all of this and the framing of sustainable development in the eu's ag agreements um there's a question in the chat pointing out that that rcep um does not apparently include a sustainable development environment labor chapter and of course two of the members of the rcep agreement 
were are parties to to big agreements with uh, the EU. Um, to what extent has the EU, at least in your research, um, had to contend with um, views from the other side, um, or is their bargaining power so so lopsided that they've been able to dictate terms? Thank you. Yes, this is another interesting question. I think the um, just to highlight in the two uh, countries, right? This also Singapore, who has is part of RCEP and has at the same time a TSD chapter with the European Union. Um, so as far as I know from RCEP, it was that none of the contracting or the negotiating parties really had a strong opinion of having such a chapter. And so it just fell off the negotiation. It wasn't, nobody was pushing for it. Whereas clearly the European Union, yes, they will push for a TSD chapter, even if they make concessions within. And I think an interesting example here is the China agreement, uh, where we still have in the China agreement, it's a bit particular because we're not talking about chapters, but sections, but there is a section on sustainable development. And uh, if we go into the details of the provisions, we see here and there some concessions that the European Union must have done in the sense that, for example, they do not uh, refer to two of the ILO fundamental conventions, but only to, to the other two, so not of the four. Um, so there's, there are little details, but in overall, I would say, yes, it's part of the EU package because the TSD chapter, I would say, is the, is the example par excellence of this value-driven uh, investment uh, policy. Yeah, so they would, they would definitely um, um, have a strong stance on that, yeah. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, is, is that, is that in part the, uh, the, the effect of the European Parliament again and, and their, their, their views on, on what the EU needs to achieve? That's, um, that certainly had the, the, the parliament had a role. And when we think of um, the origin of the TSD chapter, actually the first FTA to contain such a chapter is the one with Korea. Um, it was even um, started to be negotiated before the Lisbon Treaty. So before we had this clear um, obligation. Um, and it was in a time... Um, when um, there was much criticism also on the WTO, yeah, for not, it was a bit this period where we had that there is not enough to be done uh, in counterbalancing trade uh, and environment. And that's when then the European Union, um, and it was also pressure from civil society once again, which is then, of course, represented through the European Parliament in, in, in general, um, that led to, led to the first TSD chapter um, in the Korea FTA. Thank you very much. August, can I, can I turn back to you if you have any questions or comments you'd like to make? Well, I think uh, that has already been answered in a way because I was interested in uh, to what extent Stephanie can tell us a little bit about where uh, the pressure groups come in uh, and uh, whether to what extent the parliament has played a role. We have seen in Europe in particular um, quite some criticism uh, in the uh, late uh, 2000 years, uh, up in the early 2010s on investment chapters in general, uh, to what extent sustainable development concerns have kind of uh, taken into account. Uh, nowadays, criticism is no longer that uh, public, let's put it like this, it's still there, but it's no longer um, front page news. Um, could that have to do in your view with uh, those modernized versions uh, or are there other reasons? But, but I'm aware that this is a bit going beyond uh, the specific topic and will be hard to uh, assess, but um, it might be that you have some thoughts about that, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Reinisch. I think, you know, I think it fuels into what we're discussing today because it's all about better understanding um, the EU as a global actor. And of course, we talk about it as it would be like a monolithic thing, but inside there is so much ongoing. And definitely, I would I would completely underline and, 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 and also agree that in Europe, uh, civil society uh, is putting pressure on these agreements on many aspects. Investment is one of them, but there is also pressure when it comes to other issues of comprehensive trade agreements, such as, you know, regulatory cooperation is a big uh, problem for civil society. We don't want to harmonize too much uh, with the North Americans even. So, um, and if you think about back, for example, the, 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 the way in which the EU made really almost a U-turn in the CETA negotiations, um, it, it started off with something else and then at the, in parallel negotiating with the United States, which of course, due to its economic impact, was in the media. And then everybody was checking also on CETA and, you know, the, the media was very excited. Everybody was very excited. And only then the European Union adopted a new FET provision, adopted uh, shifting away from ISDS, because in the first version of the CETA uh, investment chapter, there was traditional ISDS uh, that really fell just because it fell under the radar of, of the public. And uh, so, I think the, the shift that the European Union is making based on concerns coming from the public is, is quite significant. And they do also uh, hold uh, public consultations. Yeah? So I will talk in the next panel briefly on the consultation that was conducted in 2021 on uh, the effectiveness of trade and sustainable development chapters, actually. Um, so there is a lot I think they do in terms of trying. And the reason, I guess, is also because they want to make it efficient, right? If you don't get the balloons uh, to kind of agree with what you're doing, you can, you know, <laughs> you can forget the whole agreement. That's, that's the risk of it, uh, because you will not have a signature and ratification. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe Angelos also has a view on this. Yeah, we, we, we have about five minutes uh, before our break. So I was going to ask Angelos if, if you wanted to, to add anything or, or to put any further questions to, to Stephanie. Um, a comment slash question for Stephanie, and I'll be sure to do to, to, uh, to this. I think uh, try and think that going back to the RCEP argument and uh, why there is no TSD chapter there, I think the counterpoint is that what we see in agreements concluded between 2015 onwards, there are more and more treaties be by concluded between countries that are not members of the European Union that have a language, especially on the right to regulate or on FET as a closed list, which is similar and in many cases identical to the model that is developed by the EU. So we can see the EU as a normative actor and a global influence on, on redrafting uh, substantive provisions on investment protection, but not on what matters the most on trade, on investment and sustainable development and the TSD chapter, which I think We'll have the opportunity to discuss about that in the second panel, but I think that there is a there are a, a different influence, so I, I would say, on on how the EU influences other countries that are currently negotiating and uh, the the text that they introduce in their investment treaties. With that, with that very good segue, Stephanie, can I pass it to you for for the last word? Yes, I find this uh, thought provocative, I have to say, um, because uh, if I understand Angelos correctly, he is basically saying that even in a negotiated setting where the European Union is not a negotiator, um, so let's say, um, I don't know, let's, let's take Australia and Singapore are, are negotiating, they would uh, check also best practices coming from the European Union and maybe draw um, inspiration from them. And in this respect, the European Union would really be a normative power because, you know, we take over approaches. Um, I'm not so sure about this because I haven't seen, I haven't, I, I haven't seen a necessary the FET approach, um, you know, being used by third countries uh, in, in the same way that it is actually written in, um, in, in the EU investment treaties. In the, if we just take the FET, uh, 
yes, okay, there are um, some countries that have closed lists, but you know, is the closed list, is this enough to say that this influence comes from the European Union? Uh, I'm not sure if the Indians would agree just because they have a closed list also of their FET provision because they specify its denial of justice um, and, um, and arbitrariness in, 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 in administrative proceedings, that this is part of the FET. You know that this is necessary coming from the EU. I find this challenging i think what you're saying is is interesting but i also think we have to be yeah, maybe a bit um, careful about this and on the tsd chapters i would also make a nuance that actually the north americans have have as well uh, labor and environmental chapters so even though they don't call it sustainable development chapters but they have um they have it uh, since nafta already so i think it's um not so sure about this normative power influence kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Thank you very much, August and Angelos. Um, thank you all for a wonderful panel. Um, thanks to our audience for the very insightful questions as well. Um, we've come to quarter past the hour and we will now take a 15 minute break. We'll be back at uh, half past the hour um, for our second panel which will look more in depth and closer at the uh, TSD chapters of the EU's uh, international investment agreements. So I look forward to seeing you back uh, at half past. Thank you.